Okay. Um, my name is Jim Mulholland. I'm with a uh, small company in Texas um, called Squeegee. Um, and this presentation is going to be about MongoDB, which is a document-based storage system. So, again, this is uh, about MongoDB. Uh, MongoDB is a document-based storage system um, from a company called Tengen, based out of New York. Um, it's they actually just released the 1.0 version yesterday or Thursday. Thursday they released version 1.0, so it's a production ready system. Um, and I'll give you more details as this presentation goes along, obviously. So uh, let's get to it. So first, um, Mongo. This is from the uh, MongoDB website, mongodb.org, if you want to look at the website. Uh, Mongo from Humongous is a high-performance, open-source, schema-free, document-oriented database. So that's the way it, uh, they say it on the uh, website, and a little bit as an aside. Um, they probably uh, had to use the word Humongous in there because there's been a little bit of a controversy on using the word Mongo, and a lot of people haven't been happy about that word because it's derogatory, apparently, in a lot of languages, including English. Um, I didn't realize this, but you can go to UrbanDictionary.com and look it up, and you can see some uh, interesting definitions. But uh, <laughs> so, so they, you know, it, so it's for humongous. Obviously, it was, you know, nothing. They didn't mean to hurt people. But actually, I, I've seen tweets saying they won't, people won't use it because of the name, which is a little ridiculous. So I just wanted to mention that. And uh, so <laughs> I don't know if any of you guys have seen the uh, Mel Brooks film Blazing Saddles. There is a uh, character on there called Mongo, which uh, doesn't really help the cause a whole lot. That's him. <laughs> Probably need a little more volume so you can hear what's going on, but that's fine. you get the you get the basic gist. That that's Mongo from Blazing Saddles. So, and here's a, just a, one more little Mongo clip that I thought was pretty pretty funny. Unless you're a horse lover, I guess. <laughs> so, so that's Mongo. So, but you know, he does have a good side because it turned out the guy that played Mongo, Eric Karras, was actually the dad on the show Webster. So uh, that was something I learned in doing research for this show, which I never would have known otherwise. So I thought that was pretty cool. So, but there is a good Mongo. So we're trying to get the you know a nice good image of Mongo because I got the Urban Dictionary image in my head. Like you know, it has to be a good Mongo. I, you know, in my search, I did find a good Mongo. Check this out. That's Mongo, the big gingerbread man. <laughs> and the whole I need a hero. Plays well into, into a database Mongo. <laughs> so, so that's Mongo. So, and then what I especially like is that basically MongoDB, now I can have a theme song, right? I need a hero. I need a cool database. So, awesome. So, I went through the lyrics and it's kind of fitting. Um, Bonnie Ray, or Bonnie, not Bonnie Ray, Bonnie uh, uh, Tyler, thank you. Um, yeah, maybe she was singing about databases. Check this out. Is there a white knight upon a fiery steed? Late at night, I turn and toss and turn and dream about what I need. Who doesn't do that about a database? Sleeping and sitting around that night in the bed? Man, I need a better database. He's got to be strong. He's got to be fast. Database. <laughs> he's got to be sure. He's got to be soon. He has to be larger than life. Obviously, could be database. So, to pay homage to Mongo, the humongous gingerbread man, in this presentation and map it all together using this tool, if you guys have, are questioning what I'm using, this tool called Prezi, P R E Z I dot com. It's a different way of doing presentations. It's uh, Instead of doing slides, it's on a canvas. But anyway, so I decided to do the whole thing in the image of a gingerbread man. So, so basically what I'll be doing is zooming the different sections of the gingerbread man and just to remind us that you know Mongo's a, a good guy. Good, happy, positive feelings. So why MongoDB? This is from the website also. It's a perfect blend of RDBMS and document storage systems. So Overview, Mongo, is schemaless. So, like I said, it's, it's document-based. There's no schema. You don't have columns in a table. It's all documents. Um, 
However, even though it's schemaless, you can still have dynamic queries, which is huge. Um, before we uh, discovered Mongo, we tried Couch, which is all static views. And, uh, and to do those static views, you have to do MapReduce, and it gets a little cumbersome and, and complicated. You have to know a lot of JavaScript to, to figure that out. So um, dynamic queries is nice. Um, you can have multiple indexes on a single document, um, or a con um, yeah, what they uh, consider tables, which is cool. It has replication to failover. Um, they keep saying auto sharding is coming. It's in alpha right now, and it's extremely fast. So there's been tons of uh, tests and, and stuff done on it, comparing it to um, Couch and uh, Tokyo Cabinet and MySQL and stuff, and Mongo usually is right up there, it's very close to Tokyo, if not faster, which is cool. So it's great for websites, um, which is what we're using it for. Um, caching, uh, logging, as a lot of talks about using as a logger. Um, it's scalable, and it uh, can store large objects in a tool called uh, GridFS, which is, comes with Mongo. It's an easy way to store um, big images, videos, all kinds of stuff that you usually store on the, the file system. You can now store in Mongo, which is nice. So you can access it from multiple servers very easily without worrying about going through um, the file system. What's not great for? Um, it doesn't have transactions. So if you have a transactional app, this is not the database for you. Um, if you have to do a lot of ad hoc business reporting or um, complex SQL, um, may not be the best use case. It does have um, dynamic queries, but it's not as complete as you would with you know, SQL. You know, SQL's been around for you know, 20 years or plus, and Mongo's been around for basically 18 months. So it's still new, which is exciting. They've come a very long way for in a very short time. So, um, and you know, it's 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 really, I think, a game changer in terms of what it could do and what, what it could be for the uh, community and not only the Ruby community, but any community because it's just really cool stuff. And if it's not this, something else like it. So compared to other DBs. Hero. All right, big fella. Let's crash this party. So I thought that was good because it's basically it's a new kid on the block. It's crashing the party, right? These other day bases are out there. Um, oh, I had that backwards, that quote. But, uh, you know, Mongo comes in, you know, a little bit late. I think they just, the public release, the public beta release was January or February. So we started using it early March. Um, and yeah, it's, so it's, it's a long way to, long way to go. A lot, a lot of improvements to be made. But so there's a chart, scalability and performance versus depth and functionality. Um, Memcache, obviously, is very fast. Um, but you can't do a whole lot with it. It's just a nice, easy way to get data quick. Um, key value stores, uh, like Tokyo Cabinet, um, also very fast, not as much functionality. Um, the thing, they are just keys and values, right? Keys and a string of a value. Uh, Mongo is a little farther down on the depth of functionality because it's key and binary data. So it's key and all kinds of type data you can tie to it. So you can have dates and strings and ints and arrays and hashes. Um, and then RDBMS is a little bit, you know, it's more functionality than all of them, but you know, not quite as performant in terms of the querying and inserts and stuff. And for in, in most cases, so this is actually from comes off rolls off the screen a little bit, but this is actually from the uh, MongoDB website. Um, it just compares Mongo, Couch, and MySQL. Um, just some basic, basic. Uh, Stuff I won't go through all of them, but you know, Mongo and Couch are document. MySQL is relational. Um, let's see, uh, object row storage, one large repository in Couch. Uh, Mongo splits them up into collections, which is their tables, um, whereas MySQL has tables. Um, so, uh, interface, CouchDB is all REST interface, which actually makes it really flexible, and there's a lot of things you can do with that, whereas MySQL and Mongo use native drivers, which yeah, help with the speed. So, All right, the basics. So here's just kind of an overview of what Mongo does, not in relation to Ruby, just but what Mongo gives you, a little more details on that. <laughs> So go Mongo, go! <laughs> Here we go, Mongo. So 
Um, like I said, uh, this is the way Mongo spread out. It's database collection documents, whereas RDBMS would be database table rows. Mongo is database collection documents, whereas a database is like, you know, a database. It's, it's a database. Cool thing about Mongo, it creates them on the fly. So like in Ruby or Rails application, if you define a collection, you don't have to do any kind of a create database or anything like that. If you try to insert a, a record into a collection on a database and that database is not there, it'll create the database, create the collection, and insert the row. So it all happens magically behind the scenes. Very fast, too. So, so it's nice. You don't have to worry about any of that stuff. Um, collection, uh, like I said, similar to a table. It's um, same as RDBMS, other than it doesn't have columns, right? It's a collection. It's, it's a way to group similar documents into smaller data sets. So, and that really helps out with the speed. Um, it can be indexed by one more keys, um, which helps with speed. And there are three ways to relate it to other collections. Um, you can have an embedded document, which means that if you have a parent document inside that document, you can have just basically an array of hashes, which is another embedded document. Um, foreign keys is what we think about in RDBMS. Um, you know, a person has you know a, a child, a child, you know, child table would have a person underscore ID in it. And then a DB reference is just a reference to another table within a parent table. So um, there's pros and cons of, of each of the three ways. And that's actually probably the one of the most complicated things about going to Mongo or any relational database. So you have to change the way you're thinking of you know, how you're going to uh, architect this. You know, the, the tables are different. There's so many different ways you can relate tables. There's so many different ways you can store data. It's, uh, it's just a different way of thinking. Kind of very similar, actually, I thought about this this morning. Similar to this freaking uh, Prezi presentation I'm using because it's not slides. Right, you got a big canvas, so it's just you, you got to change your mindset and how you want to relate everything. So, um, very similar in terms of uh, Mongo or document-based databases. So, a document is the actual data piece. It's the row inside the collection. Um, each document stores both a key and a value. So it's just basically you, you have a hash. So you have a document is just uh, it's a single row of an array and a hash is basically what it is. And that hash can have you know anything in it. So I'm not going into more detail on that in a bit. So the storage it uses. Um, it uses a, something called bison is how they pronounce it, which stands for binary JSON. Um, so binary JSON is a data storage format for documents in Mongo. It allows for storage of data types that JSON does not allow, such as date data format and bin data format. But Basically, a way for them to store a whole bunch of different types of data, so out of the box, which is very cool. Um, querying. So this is uh, Mongo actually comes with a console tool, so you can actually go straight into the database and actually query just like you would SQL. Uh, it has its own query language, so these are kind of some of the, the types of queries you can do. So um, here you got the DB. So if you you got a declared database, you know, so you know, uh, DB dot connect. So I didn't do all this, but if you had a database name, you connect that database. And collection is actually the collection name. So this could be like people. Um, so db.people.find. And then um, first name, colon, you know, first name being the column name or you know, the, the entity name, property name, and then what you're looking for. So in this case, John. Um, so it also has a very cool feature of regex searches, so you can search based on a, a regex. So this is just an example of that, just using your, your regex notation of slash slash. We actually, um, one of our tools is tweetcongress.org, is one of the tools we wrote with Mongo. And we just do a, a Mongo database search. So if you go to Tweet Congress and do a search, you can do any kind of regex search, and you can search for, like, it's Congress. So like one of the searches I'll do is go out and just look for you know number values to see like dollar amounts Congress is talking about and stuff in tweets, which is pretty cool. So you couldn't do that in most other searches. So that is a nice feature. And here's just find by ID. Mongo by default has an ID field of underscore ID. So your primary key is going to be called underscore ID. So this is basically just finding something by underscore ID. Um, so here's another interesting uh, bit of Mongo, and I'll show you a little bit more of this in a second. But um, greater than, less than, those kinds of uh, operators are in this format. Dollar sign GT is greater than. So if you want, in this case, they're trying to find someone that is older than 21. So instead of age, you know, with a greater than sign or anything like that, it's basically multiple hash notation. So age colon, and then another you know, brace greater than colon 21. So 
different way of thinking about it, but once you uh, you know use it a little bit, it, it, it makes a little bit of sense. And the cool thing is a lot of the Ruby ORMs, you don't really have to worry about this stuff a whole lot. Um, so here's just searching for an embedded document. So um, so in this case, you had a um, a collection of I don't even know what this collection would have been, but um, uh, person um, mm, book. So this collection is probably book, right? So you have a book collection or db.books.find, and then you you're looking for all books that have an author of first name John. So in this case, you have a embedded document inside the book collection. So you have a book with all the book information. Then part of one of those fields in books is author. And then author is first name, last name, et cetera. And here you can just say author, first name, John. Um, so easy way to, to, you can easily go inside collections and um, deep, di deep dive into them to do queries. So and then this is something I really don't use a whole lot, but it has a concept of where. So and this is just an example of how you can use a where clause. Um, so it's a uh, little it's JavaScript and some other stuff. Honestly, I don't do this ever, but uh, you could. <laughs> so, yep. Right. Yeah. So that was something I mentioned. So good point. Thank you. So yeah, you can you can do a lot. Very flexible. So. But it kind of gets back to the MapReduce JavaScript stuff. And I, I try to stay away from that. We haven't had to have a, a big use case for that yet, but it's definitely there if you need it. So more querying. I mentioned that those uh, notations you can use. Um, these are some of them. You have your in. So if you wanted to search for something in, you know, just like you would in, in SQL, um, nin is not in, not equal is ne. Um, all is interesting. All is if you want to find um, find data where. It's, it's in where n is an or kind of all is everything. So if you pass in all with an, an array, you can find values that have all of these fields in it. It's kind of complicated. I should have had an example of that. Um, and then greater than, greater than or equal to, less than. There's also a less than or equal to, which I didn't mention there. Um, size and where are some of the other ones. Now the other cool thing, um, a lot of this, the documentation on MongoDB is actually pretty good. And if it's not documented, the Google group is awesome. If you have a question about Mongo, you go to the MongoDB Google group, they'll usually respond within a, literally, if it's more than five minutes, it's amazing. Someone from TenGen responding to you about whatever your question is. It's been phenomenal. And a lot of times, if there's an issue, they'll have it fixed within a day, so in a release. And so that, that's actually been one of the most pleasant pieces about working on this platform is that the, the guys supporting it are, are really responsive and really easy to work with. So, so definitely check out the Mongo Google group. Um, so fields is like uh, select in Active Record. And this is actually really important because um, you're pulling back when you're doing data, especially when you're pulling back a lot of data. If you have big objects, especially with a lot of embedded objects, those, those objects can be huge. And if you're just looking for like a name, um, you know, it can make the difference between a query coming back in a second versus you know a hundredth of a second, a thousandth of a second. If you just like name versus, you know, we have uh, like. Twitter, we have a person that has the uh, person, and that person has lots of stats and stuff that we're tying the Twitter type stats for Tweet Congress and some other apps that we have. So the, the one piece of data is huge. So pulling back all that every time is, is a big deal. But if you do something you know, like this fields and, and specify what field you want to select, it, it makes a huge difference. And we've learned that the hard way a few times, learning why the heck pages are taking so long to load, and that, that's why we're just pulling back tons of data. So something to keep in mind. Uh, limit. Um, an offset is comes out of the box for pagination, so really easy to paginate with Mongo. Um, sort, just like you would with any kind of RDBMS, um, works on any any column. So and then count and group, just out of the box. Um, so you can just do a you know, person dot count and pass in some kind of conditions clause, and you, you'll get the the count, the number of items in a, a deal, a collection. So other cool stuff. Cap collections. So this is kind of similar to caching in that um, it's last you set a collection size that you want a uh, a collection to be, and once you get to that size, all the old stuff just starts dropping out. So it's really good for like log if you want to start storing logs and stuff, and you know, all the old stuff you don't care about. So it'll just you know get erased at the end. So um, there's a little example on how to create one of those down there, but yeah, it's. Uh, it's a nice feature if you don't, just don't need all the, the most recent data. I mean, you don't need all the older data. 
Upserts is basically just an easy way to do find or create. So it has a, um, a basically, if you can call an update, and here we have basically, it's a unique field of Joe in this case. It's basically saying, okay, if Joe exists, um, you know, just update his age to 20. If he doesn't exist, go in and create it. So instead of having to do that in the, the Ruby layer or the application layer, it just does uh, for you automatic magically behind the scenes. GridFS I touched on a second ago, a little while ago. Um, it's a way to store large documents. So we're using this also for similar tools and it makes it nice and easy that you don't have to worry about how you can get to the file system. Question? Uh, don't think so. Good question. I don't know. Um, what's that? Probably so. Yeah. I mean, we're just we're right now we're just storing images, image data. So it's just you know uploading it to the database and just accessing it tied to a model. So works really well. Makes it nice and easy. That way we don't worry about file system. If you have multiple servers and stuff, it's just like you're hitting the database and you can get all kinds of big binary blobs of data. So it has two collections to store the data, um, files. Stores the. It's basically a collection itself. It has a files um, document to store the object or collection to store the ob uh, file metadata. You know, file size, file type, all that kind of stuff. And that has um, a chunks collection that stores actually stores the binary data. So, and these are all the languages that they support right now. So, C++, Java, Perl, PHP, Ruby, Python, and then SpiderMonkey JavaScript are the drivers that they have out of the box. And they're, they're creating quite a few other jo uh, drivers or having helped create other, quite a few other drivers. So it's uh, definitely uh, pretty, pretty widespread. Uh, it seems like there's quite a good following in the Python community already. A lot of stuff from Python guys. So, and Ruby is getting pretty big. So there's my gingerbread guy again. So Ruby. So uh, this is how Mongo interfaces with Ruby. That really has nothing to do with Ruby. I just like that last line, more heat, less foam. <laughs> um, anyway, so, so uh, here are the drivers that are currently available for um, Ruby. Uh, you got the, the bare to the bones Mongo Ruby driver, which you, you know, if you were gonna build your own ORM or something, that's what, what you'd use. It's uh, pretty, pretty in-depth and there's a lot of functionality with it. You can do a lot of things with it. Um, they have an Active Director adapter. I've never actually used it. I'm not sure, um, you know, it, what kind of luck you have with it. It's kind of tough to uh, to marry the two, but they do have an adapter, so you're more than welcome to try that. Mongo Record is actually what we started using when we first started using Mongo. Um, it's very Active Record-like, but it's its own adapter, so you can use it with you know non-Rails projects and stuff. Um, we actually submitted some patches of that and created a, a plugin on, on top of that. And then the last one is uh, Mongo Mapper, which John Newmaker um, created. And a little story behind that, we actually, the whole reason this came about was a chance meeting of Wynn and I with John at RailsConf in Las Vegas back in May. We happened to sit down with him at lunch. And you know we were big into Mongo then, and literally we're the only person that heard of it at RailsConf, as far as I know, RailsConf. Um, we talked to everybody and anybody that would listen to us about it, and no one had a clue what we're talking about. John being one of those guys, saying, you know, okay, why, why do I care about this? And uh, so we got to, um, you know, we went through a whole conference, and we actually got home, and he like sent us an email or something saying, God, this is cool. And uh, you know, I want to, you know, I want to create an ORM for this deal. And so I thought he's not. So like, why don't you just extend the ones that have you? That excited about it, but you know, he decided to do his own deal, and he did Mongo Mapper. Uh, and it turned out great. So we, uh, our most recent project that we're using now with with uh, Ruby, you're just using Mongo Mapper, and it's it's very it's a very nice ORM. So some of the things that it gives you out of the box is typecasting. So you can when you define your your keys, and I'll go in this a little more detail. You can say what type data type you want it to be, string, date, int, what have you. Which at first I thought was silly, but uh, John's point was well, if you're submitting something from a form, like you know if you have an age on a form. 
how would Mongo know that you know age should be an int, right? You just store it as a string otherwise. So if you're data typing everything, it's you know now you can it knows that it's an int. So very good point, and actually worked out really well. Um, callbacks after save, etc. So those work out of the box. Validations is very cool. Um, validates presence of, validates numericality of all that stuff works. Different, a little different notation on how it works. And I'll show you that in a second. Um, per object connection, per object database. So if you have a person object, you can have it connect to a totally different server if you wanted to. You can have it connect to a totally different database. So you just define it in the, in the model. So you can connect wherever you want. So it, it makes it very flexible. Um, associations, so has many, belongs to, works. Um, find all, find first, find last, all that. Um, find, I didn't put in, in here, um, but uh, custom finder, like, you know, uh, find by first name works, find by last name works. Um, custom IDs, so the primary key, the underscore ID field. Um, by default, Mongo gives you a big O GUID. So if you have a, you know, if you're doing a show on a Rails page where you do person, you know, dot slash ID is going to be person slash, then boom, huge ID. So um, Mongo Mapper allows you to do a custom ID. You just specify what you, what you want your custom, what your ID field to be. So you could be, you know, first name dash last name or something. So your URL will look pretty. Um, now Dynamic Founders is there, uh, find by name. And then uh, create keys on the fly is cool. Um, you don't have to declare all your keys in your model. If you want to throw in a key on the fly, you can. This is really nice for um, interfacing with APIs, like Twitter API. We, we interface with live APIs. Question? Right, yeah, sharding's coming. So that, that's, like I said, it's an alpha now. But yeah, we actually have a use case for it now that would be awesome. But um, they say it's coming, it should be soon to shard it. But yeah, right now, they have nothing out of the box. So like you wanted to shard by city or something like that. Right, yeah, so it, it's supposed to be coming before the end of the year, so, which would be very nice. Um, yep. Yeah, be I think it's different day, uh, different collections. So if you have a person you want to shard by city, you know, the, the usual use case is Craigslist, right? You want to shard by city. So you have a Craigslist and you want to have all the city, um, city, what would you call Craigslist listings? City listings, I guess, in one place, right? If you have Houston or Austin, that would just be its own collection. So, you know, so everything would be based off the city. So everything that's tied, all the listings would be by city, would be separated by city in that case. So. Honestly, I don't know exactly how they're going to implement it, but uh, that's my understanding of it. So. Um, what is actually the actual physical storage? Mm -hmm. um, it, uh, it's interesting. Their storage is, um, it starts with a single file. Um, that's one thing I, I did not mention here, is something about the storage. It uses memory, memory map files. So it makes, it, it makes it really fast. The problem is it makes it look like your memory is completely 100% used because it, it, it basically looks like it's grabbing all the memory, but in reality it's not. It's just there. I mean, if something else needs the memory, you can take it. But a lot of people they use they install Mongo and they look at their memory like, whoa, I can't use this. You know, it's taking on my memory, but it doesn't actually it, you know impact performance. Um, but the actual files it uses, um, it uses some crazy deal. The first file is 16 megs, and then the next file, it's you know twice the size, and it goes up to like two gigs, and then it has you know multiple files of two gigs. It just creates, and it creates a new one. You know, it, it uses a ton of memory, hard drive memory, um, physical memory on the machine because it it always spawns another memory file before it needs it. So you could be one point, you know, use, you know, one and three quarters gigs of memory in this one for one particular database. And before you needed that second gig, it already creates a second two gig file in your machine. So it can also, you know, roll over to use that right away. <coughs> so there's no impact. So it definitely can use a lot of memory. And we have a tool that we're creating multiple databases for a single application. And you know, our, our mem memory data usage, physical data usage is, is big because it, you know, it takes a lot of memory. So both you know, virtual memory and physical hard drive. So, so, but the keys on the fly, and I mentioned this a little more in a second, but it's basically if you wanted to, if you wanted to integrate with the API, it's kind of getting onto. Um, you know, y you can just suck in date data from a JSON field and just store it into Mongo without having to declare in your model. 
and then you could still be able to use dot notation to get to that data after it's stored the first time without doing any kind of declaration or anything like that in your model, which is pretty cool. So, so here's an example. Sorry about the, uh, I was trying to do color syntax highlighting, so I did a screenshot and it didn't turn out as well as I was hoping. But um, it's somewhat readable. So here's um, just uh, multiple model uh, class, you know, multiple classes, models, whatever you want to call them, um, objects. So you have a person, has many addresses, has many posts, and then here's the keys that we we're talking about, first name. Um, so validation, um, here in this case, first name is required true, that's the validation. So instead of doing, you know, validates presence of, you just do required true. Same thing, last name, age is, you know, this is uh, validates numericality of, just say numeric true. Um, and then uh, the data typing there also. Um, so, so we have two different types of relationships here. Address is actually a, um, an embedded document. So it's actually going to be stored with person. So in this case, you have a person. That person will have a document. Inside that document will be an address field. So it's actually one document. The second one is a post, which is just going to be a foreign key type relationship. And yeah, we, uh, John actually released a new version of Mongo Mapper yesterday. And since that reversion dropped yesterday, you have to specify the person underscore ID key. Before you didn't, um, but he decided that was too magic. So now you have to do the person ID. So if you have a person has many posts, you have to make sure you specify that key. So, so here's kind of some examples of how that works. So creates and updates. So, so I'm going over the person. Let's let you know what the person looks like. Those are the fields. So I do a create, um, and then just like you would any kind of just active record is all this is. So first name, last name, um, age, et cetera. Um, after the person, so this is basically on an IRB. This is what I put in, and this is the output. This outputs the, uh, the object. So, and then this is also a very, very active record-ish. Um, person.last gives me a, a, the person object that is entered in there. And then person.fadeColors returns the array that I just submitted when I submitted the doc. So, it, you know, get the array in that case. Um, so here is an example of favorite animal didn't include, wasn't included in person, right? I didn't mention favorite. I didn't know I was going to need favorite animal. Maybe it's just coming from an API or something. So, you know, so I'm grabbing the person data from an API. It has favorite animal in there equals dog. So you do that, you save it, and then once you went after uh, you went and got the data, the object again, you can do person that favorite animal, and you'd have dog. So without any kind of definition defining. Um, same thing. This is just going one step further, saying you can even do that with a, a hash if you wanted to. So if you go in and define a hash that wasn't defined at all in your original model, you could do that. So I just did a family hash of that person, <coughs> saved it. So here, the class it knows it's a hash, in this case, an ordered hash. Um, and then the, to access the data within that, just person, you know, dot family, and then whatever part of the hash you want to access, and it returns that set of data. So embedded documents, I just touched on. So this is an embedded document, the address. Um, in this case, it just um, has the address, which is basically the street number, city, state, zip. Right. Yeah, kind of a second class citizen. You can't, you, uh, so some of the drawbacks of embedded documents is you can't do queries on them, right? So I couldn't go here and now and do, give me all addresses of people in Houston because it's tied to a person. I can find all people that are in Houston, but I can't just get all the addresses, right? If you wanted to do a search on, like if you had posts and comments, right? <coughs> and you wanted to show all the comments in one place, it probably not, doesn't make sense to do that in an embedded document. You know, at first glance, you think, yeah, those should be embedded documents. But if you wanted to show just the comments, or be able to search in just the comments, it's, it's not easy to do if it's an embedded document. It should be its own model. Yes? Um, let's see, if you've got an attribute for presence in this object, mm -hmm. a particular object, what happens if you can't access it within a certain time? Does it return an error, or does it just return an error? Oh, if you do a person dot cats or something that wasn't defined, um, I think it raises an error. I don't know. Um, do you know when, off the top of your head? <laughs> so, yeah, we'll, we'll let you know. Um, so, but here's the embedded document. So, to, to store that embedded document, you create an address.new um, to get your address doc, and then you just, uh, just like you would an array, you just set that into um, person. That's actually a bad carriage return there. A person.save should be on the next line. But that's how you would add a person to 
um, add an address to a person as an embedded document. And then here is, um, so then you just do person that address that first, um, addresses that first and gives you that address. If that person had multiple address, addresses, you could, you know, obviously get them all there. Per any person that addresses that last would work too. And then here's a person that find first, and here I'm just doing kind of touched on what I touched on was doing the Mongo console example, um, just doing a deep dive to find the person that lives in a particular city in this case. So find all people that live in Houston, and that we would return you know, a, an array of, or in this case, one, because it's the first. But if you did all, it would return an array of people, all the people that lived in Houston, not the addresses, it would return the people. So that's a, a key differentiator there. So foreign key relationships. So this is kind of what I just touched on in terms of posts. So a person has lots of posts. <coughs> um, include here would be a Mongo Mapper um, document. I didn't mention, but you know, it's, I think it was there. But yeah, here it's embedded document. That's the, on, the only difference with using Mongo Mapper in terms of defining as a, an embedded or a non-embedded document. So here we have a, a post that's uh, just a document, but it has that um, person ID. I didn't do a belongs to here. I could have. It belongs to person, um, but person has many posts down there. So it's just like a, a SQL relationship in that case. So here you can do a build like we, you, do, you do in Rails or, or Ruby, a person that posts that build, and that automatically includes the, the person ID, and that's, <laughs> that's the Mongo ID that gives you by default. So that's the, uh, the big uh, good thing it gives you. Um, so, uh, so you can do a build, creates the, uh, the post for you, um, and then uh, you do post.content in this case, and this is a post, and then save, and that saves your post, and that way then that person's already tied to that post because you did the build. Um, and then this just shows how you get it, just like you, you would think you would. Person that posts that first, that content, and gives you the content of that post. So uh, validations, uh, which I just touched on. So. So in this case, like I mentioned, first name, last name are required true, age, numeric true. So if I did person.new, in this case, I didn't add a last name, so I just did first name and my age, I did 12. Instead of the number 12, I did you know 12 written out. So if you try to save that, um, you get, you know, it won't save, it'll give you a false in terms of the save, and I'll throw a couple errors. Um, you know, must be a number, can't be empty, just like you would expect with active record. So, um, be good. So, I figured that was a, a good way to end it, and that's basically my deal. Um, my name is Jim Mulholland, so that's my Twitter and my email. So, if you guys have any questions, let me know. That's it. No questions? Yeah. <laughs> hey, what is uh, the resolution for that content? Like, is it around the millisecond microseconds? Or oh, uh, that I don't know. I've not had a so need right, to know that. Right, yeah, so whatever Ruby goes down to, but that's something I've never had to have that kind of detail. Uh, yeah, I don't think it's possible to store it on S3. Yeah, it's just you store it on a, a server. So it has a, um, it, you run it as a server on a, you literally do, you download the, the unzip the tarball. No, and I, you I don't mean everything. I mean, you know, right. without the, the, you can store some of your assets somewhere else to save them, like in SSD or something like that. Right, right. No, it's kind of a misnomer of document-based database because it's still all in memory on your server, so it's not really documents at all. So, I mean, it, it's, you can do backups and, you know, store them to wherever you want to store them. Just zip up a backup and it has all that kind of utility you can use, but you can't actually store the physical documents on a Amazon or anything like that. You could, you could have other servers. You can uh, specify, so when you start your server or your, yeah, your Mongo server, you can specify where you want it to store the, or where you want it to store the data, and it can be anywhere. But uh, I don't think it could be S3. I could be wrong. I just, that's something I've never looked into. Question? Mm -hmm. 
Right. Right, like favorite animal. I did. Yeah, you could do yeah person that find by favorite animal and just boom. It's more typecasting, okay. more than anything. Yeah, it's already there, and you have the typecasting. So, but yeah, you don't really need it. You know, if you don't care about typecasting, you don't need it at all. So, and it's, it's um, the other thing is if you wanted to do notation of uh, you know person. So like to do the favorite animal, I, you have to use bracket notation like you would a hash. I couldn't do person dot favorite animal equals cat because it doesn't know favorite animal exists yet. So the first time you add it, you have to do person bracket notation favorite animal equals cat. So that's the other difference. Yep. You mentioned that it wasn't good for it because you don't have a lot of transactions. It doesn't mean it doesn't support transactions at all. Yeah, that doesn't doesn't support transactions at all. Let's say with the option you had a vector of a certain example. What do you mean? It, it, they do have two JSON, right? Yeah, so um, I know they didn't have it at first, but yeah, I'm pretty sure it has it now. I don't know about 2XML. Yeah. yeah. Right, yeah, it, it's a fast moving deal. So <laughs> it's tons, tons of work being done on here. So. Oh, cool. <laughs> yeah, oh, definitely. Yeah, no, it's it's and it's the the amount of um, support has gotten since the Rails conf, like in May. I mean, we are. I've already talked to you know, Rich. I talked to him. Rich is using Rich Kilmer, so there's lots of people already using it now. It's just it's, it's a like the one of the first slides is a perfect blend of RDBMS and document based databases. It's very flexible and, and easy to use, and it's kind of natural. <laughs> Yeah, as a full profiler, you can profile the queries and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, all the, the details that you'd expect in a database. Shows you at where things are fast, where they're not, where indexes are should be used, and all that kind of stuff. So. Which platform does it with that thing? Like Oh, uh, I don't know if I've seen any studies on that. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, my guess would probably be Linux, just because that's used as de facto, and probably not Windows, but that's just because that's <laughs> normal. <laughs> so. Yeah. <coughs> oh, good point. So one big thing, um, <laughs> Mongo does not work well because of the memory map files. It does not work well in 32-bit system. It works, but you can only have a database size up to two gigs because of the way it maps memory files. So it, it really prefers 64-bit operating systems. So it's something to keep in mind that if you want to install, like, so we we try to do uh, we try to do tweet Congress or something on uh, a 32-bit EC2 instance, and we, we, we couldn't because we had too much data in there already. So um, something to keep in mind, it prefers 64-bit. Yep. Uh, mm -hmm. There you go. Milliseconds state resolution. OK, cool. That's a good question. You know, John? Yeah, they don't have complex resolutions fully in there yet, but yeah. yeah, so apparently it's being worked on. Yeah, I don't think it's there yet. So. Anyway. Oh, yep. What's the presentation software you use again? Prezi, P R E Z I. So they actually have a free version that, we, that you'd have a little Prezi logo down here. And this is not the way you want to do Prezi, by the way. This is just me being silly. Um, <laughs> you, you don't want presentations where you draw things. The, the cool thing about Prezi is you'd have multiple sections of a presentation, and then when you're asking questions, you can easily just, you know, if I wanted to answer stuff on something, let's easily zoom in, and, you know, if someone wants to know about that, I can just zoom into that section and talk about that. So it's really, it's just a good way to see an overview of the, your whole presentation, then easily drill down into different parts of that presentation. So, yeah, this is actually a horrible way of doing it, but that's just decided to do it that way. So, all right, well, thank you guys. I appreciate it.